Hello, everybody. If it's Wednesday, it's Warhammer, and that must mean it's time for another episode of Warhammer Weekly. Joining me this week, as always, my my fearless co-pilot across the seas of the mortal realms. It's Tom. How you doing, Tom? Hello, friends. Uh, we're, we're we're riding the waves toward the coming Deepkin release. We're going to talk about that some a little bit during news this week, but we're not doing we're not doing the full review yet. That's not tonight, as you probably saw from the click. But don't worry. It's coming. The book will be, you know, coming this Saturday. So we will be talking about it. But this week, we're talking about something I'm very excited about, a personal passion of mine. Uh, and that is gamer motivation and psychographic profiles. And to do that, we're joined by Andrew. Hey, buddy, how you doing today? I'm good. How are you guys? Uh, I am great, man. It is good to have you on. I'm. We were going to do this a little while ago, then we had to reschedule. So thank you for being flexible. It is deeply appreciated. Happy and to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to talk all about why we play the games we play. And I think uh, one of the goals is to perhaps maybe a little self-education, right? Like learning a little about ourselves and why we do things. and uh, helping. I know of about the me on this journey. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, took, I took like multiple of the profiles. I did the video game one, the board game one. We'll talk about this later. And then right. I went and I was like, I realized that technically Warhammer fits into the board game category. So I was like, okay, wait. So what if I do, because I took it as if I was talking about like the games we play around here with the family. And then I was like, wait a minute. I threw Warhammer in and something was like, man, it skewed like hard. <laughs> that's so funny that your anchoring changes like that. Right. But that's, yeah, it's yeah, an it's interesting like, point. I, like flipping a switch. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, no. uh, that's one of my points, man. We'll talk about that later. Motivations can change with mood. There you go. Awesome. I love it. So we're going to dive deep into that. Talk about all sorts of different motivations and, we're all going to go on a journey of self-discovery together. It's going to be a good time. Here we go. Uh, but first up, of course, we've got some news. We do indeed. Um, we have the rumor engine that dropped. Um, so it's definitely a squig, maybe some elves, <laughs> or a window. It's, it's a window, definitely. I'm leaning heavily towards window. Yeah. Would you or, like me to, to share this yeah, image? I mean, realistically, yes. You go ahead and share it. But I mean, not only is it a window, it's a window we know. Yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and share the actual like yeah. compiled rumor engine thing with the recent updates. So yeah. here's here's our undiscovered rumor engines, right? Um, here here's our stuff. Yep. And so my guess is this is part of the new black coach. I stand behind that. What, um, the, the news, the hangman's news. Yeah, really part of the new night hunt thing. Yeah, I because I think they photoshopped out the rest of this crap. I think oh. this is, I don't think it's a hangman's use. I think it's a little it's thing. A support, like yeah, a, it's a support for a lantern okay. on the front. Yeah, of the I can see that. Right. Uh, um, I'm going Skaven. I, I, I would love it if you were right, my friend. I would love it if you were right. Um, but yeah, so all this stuff is marked off. Um, here's the new one, right? It's this window. And like, yeah, it's this window right here. We've from the same, seen it. From the same building there. that this, this other rumor engine was from. Like, come on, guys. I know they have a bunch of awesome models they could be spoiling. Uh, Max, the you know one of the the in-house painters, the guy yep. who painted uh, one of the new Eidolons, did an amazing job with it. Was talking about how excited he is about the next like eighteen months because of everything that's that uh, that he's painted, you know, over the last year and a half. And um, yeah, start sharing, man. Let's go. Let's do it's this. It's so fascinating that the the you know as you had said the unreleased. Um, like the question of number one. Yeah, what is February eighth? Um, I am telling it's, you, it's an unreleased KO kit. Like they they pulled back. This kit didn't make it into the book or something like that. Because we know it's not on any of the KO kits that are out there, but it looks too well, much like the rest of the KO stuff. We don't think it is, but hold on just a minute. Lots of people have dug and looked at every angle of every KO to make sure that's not one of the things. Like this rumor engine has sat around for a year plus. Well, somebody mentioned on the forum that it was actually, and and somebody then quickly said, "No, it's not. It looks, it's not that thing you think it is." Hmm. Yeah, I was checking the infant master because that's definitely one that me and most other people have never painted. Sure, um, sure, sure. And so I'm seeing if it if it's in the kit, but it's I not. guess not. No. Nope. Um. Yeah. I mean, like I'm telling you, it's unreleased. And then the other one that really I want to know is I want to know what this freaking shoulder pad is. This one that's floated around forever. Like, I'm so curious about this thing. Yeah. 
or whatever this is. So I think it's undead orcs. I it'd be cool. That'd be neat. I'd love some different takes on undead, but you know, we'll you see. You heard it here first, folks. Undead orcs. Okay. Okay. And like these most of these are like you look at it, we just have a few floating from like that early part of last year. And then all of a sudden we just, you know, then it then it becomes all the recent stuff, right? Yep. yep. Um, the last couple months. So and I mean, I my distinct feeling is that this guy and this guy and this guy are all from the theoretical night haunt thing we're just about to talk about. Yep. So speaking of great transition, um, uh, sure, I'll jump to the summer. Um, we have additional rumors now of um, a box set for um, the, you know, like, again, we're hearing multiple sources and the way that this is like triangulating, a lot of folks are saying that like, oh, we have like the AOS 2.0 and they're saying June now and with the with the GHB 2018 being released in July is what this what they're suspecting. Um, uh, but you know when you look when you put all this together, the picture that I think that it paints is that we're going to get a, a Night Haunt and Stormcast box probably in the like June July time frame, and there may be in the in that box rule new rules for like magic. Um, some type of reimagined magic system or bolt on system, if you will, much like they described, much like they described the malign portent system as a bolt on system. Yeah, I, I, and I would imagine it will be exactly what that that will be where that big purple sun we've seen goes, right? Um, because like we've seen the giant purple sun model, they were they very clearly showed that thing, right? Um, during uh, the Pokemon. yeah, exactly. The purple Pokemon ball. And uh, and so, you know, undoubtedly... Purple that sun. It's a purple sun, folks. Yes. Well, I, and what's funny is I heard it called by a different name in there. So, like, I'm not totally sure it will end up being that. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, like, I do agree with you that that would be... Uh, it's. I'm trying to st st stack all of this in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because, like, okay, if June is the bot, we know July, the, the point we know is that the big FAQ, much like what they just dropped for 40K, yep. happens yep. in July. Yep. Right? Yep. And, we, and Vince and I, we, we talked about this. We talked about what this would actually look like. Because if, if the GHB actually drops in October or in July, as they're saying as well, what, like, what would the, when would the FAQ drop in relation to it? And what we kind of reason through would be that we will likely see a very early July uh ghb 2018 followed a couple weeks later probably the end of the month by the big faq probably to clarify anything from the ghb as well as catch any of the outstanding issues from the last six months you know it's interesting um if you'll remember the faq from the january one dropped very 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 late january right it was sure. after lvo yep um and so i would suspect that that's what we'll probably see again so andrew question for you yes. let's assume that there are some kind of minor tweaks uh as we get to sort of that big faq or in the box set which they could do right we saw in the big faq for 40k by the way that there was both the finalization of some beta rules changes and some new like testy match play type changes as well right so we know that they're going to use these FAQs to sort of roll out potential rules changes. Like they did it in 40K. There's no reason to think they wouldn't also do it in AOS. So if you were going to pick a thing or two to show up in this, what's your thing or two you'd want to see? Man, the monster, the monster should not go on the Bailwind Vortex. Mm. <laughs> like under, just you're saying under any circumstances, it just can't happen. That's you know, every that's time, clarification. Every time they get a little more clear and a little more clear and a little more clear, I think the intent is there not to put the monster on the Bailwind Vortex. Sure. That's about no, putting monsters on Bailwind Vortexes. Yeah, that they keep people keep trying to cheat it, like find the little space in the language of where they actually, uh -huh. well, I can switch the setup or I can transform this, you know, like uh, da, 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 squeeze in that little rule spot, you know? Yeah. Uh, joking aside, I am just tremendously pleased with the state of the game. I think the rules are super solid. Uh, summoning comes to mind. Summoning could be a little more interesting. I don't have any solutions for that. Um, really, I think the only, like, 
big swing and miss aside from a couple little FAQ things. Like the other day, I ran into a thing with smashing and bashing where I killed off a unit and the next available unit was a unit of brutes which had charged and can't swing at anything. Are they available to attack? They, they charge. They could pile in and attack. Uh, tricky stuff like that. Uh, that I wish would just be able to be answered more quickly, but that's asking a lot. Uh, as far as the I mean, only, technically only they would be an available unit because they've already piled in, so it would jump to the next unit. That's not. Well, I think he's saying they hadn't piled yeah, in. Yeah, if they day. charged, but they hadn't piled in, like right next door to that one. You're saying oh, yeah. that unit mm -hmm. lost its target because your main yeah. unit they yeah, were they had both charged one thing. Yeah. Unit A killed what it was fighting. Hence, leaving Unit B without an immediate target within three inches. Technically, you could still activate them and pile them in, and if they're three inches, yeah. pile in, brought them to the nearest enemy, they should be able to fight. Yeah, because but, you can pile in when you charge, even if there's no enemy within range anymore. Right, right. As long as the initial charge was valid. But anyway, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. So there, there are little tricky things like that. I mean, I'm just so... If, if you just look at the, the armies at Adepticon, I mean, I brought Archaeon, uh, and I won three games. No worries. Uh, I, I got to play Bretonians. I played a guy who had Chaos Dwarves, and everything seemed to be competitive. You can get a good game yep. out of almost anything. I feel like the only big swing and a miss uh, was Zinch, because they just have too many good things. I, they kept thinking of awesome good things to put in, and they put them all in the book, and they can control too much space. They have too much magic, too much range, too much movement. Sure. Uh, so the, change, the, the changeling. It's just a little too much. Other than that, I think these books, man, are just, they're just killing it. Uh, I would still push back and say that KO are, um, they swing too far one way or the other. Like, there's not really yeah. a good middle ground for KO. Yeah, yeah it's not like we're going to say every army is in a perfect yeah. place. There's you, But you can push tweaks like that through little things, right? I mean, system-wide, somebody already mentioned it in the comments. I know the thing I would pick, and that would be the limit, like, limit pre off war scroll prayers yep. To, yep. to one, like they did with the daughters. Yep. Right. Um, so that you can't like multi I would, I would variant, be multi bronze that. flesh, if multi. They did that to my uh pestilence, the prayers on the war scrolls, I think I'd sell the army. Well, yeah, that's we're why not, I like the idea of it. We're yeah. talking about the, we're yeah. not we're talking about the special prayers that are being added as a bonus, which you're not getting in pestilence. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think yeah. that's fair. I like the idea. I like I actually thought the daughters cut it rather nicely yeah. with the off war scroll prayers. <laughs> right. Like I thought that was actually a very well, good. Well, the special no, it's it. not off war scroll prayers because technically the the avatar is off war scroll prayers. So it's 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 prayers from that the, thing. Yeah, it's they're fair. specialized. You know, fair enough. Yes, yeah. it is. I, uh, yes, and my primary gaming partner will tell you this: um, Beast Claw need to be better because he's got <laughs> a full, full great army that uh, doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, about that. <laughs> yeah, that's they're they're a tough one because they they were so unkillable and so strong and then fell apart so fast right once but because of that one minor change it's funny and and the other shifts in the meta and that just oh. shows you how just very small tweaks can make very large impacts oh yep. yeah oh yeah yup but uh, right. yeah I'm I'm very pleased with the state of the game uh, I, I would agree I remember this time last year just waiting for that general's handbook and right now I'm still having a good time with those six. Uh, missions from this one and all the armies that are present. Yep. Yep. Um, I agree. So somebody real quick, somebody asked in the comments, I want to kind of talk about this. You know, the question in the comments was so blood boil, which is on the slaughter priest's yeah. war scroll. Yeah. D six mortal wounds. D six mortal wounds is okay to spam. Like under what we're describing, my answer would be yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, now if, plus test, you're good. Well, uh, yeah. One, it's four up. If you, unless you're in gore pil pilgrims where you can reroll, but either way, regardless of that, if it were to be a problem, then just uh, then commensurately either adjust the points of Gore Pilgrims, the Slaughter Priest, or Blood Boil. Right? There's three other things you can press on. There are the without a game wide, yeah. yeah, without making it a game wide thing. The reason I don't like making the on War Scroll things limited for the prayers, and why I like the Dock ones, is because there is some that it makes sense you'd want to do multiple times, and a lot of them have a. a have a like, not necessarily bad effect being being on spent. dock. There's like a prayer that increases your weapon from like with a like two or three attacks from one damage to a d3 damage. It's not really good, <laughs> like it's okay, but like you know, like it's just not it's not stellar. 
and it brings those heroes up to like normal melee capability for a five, you know, for a five wound hero. Sure. So, so yeah, I mean, my answer would be I'm not I'm not a super fan as somebody who does regularly play against a, a Gore Pilgrims list. I'm certainly not a super fan of being spammed by Blood Boil, and that does happen. Um, but like. At the same time, those guys aren't that hard to kill. So, you know. There, there is one change that, and I don't know how exactly to word this in the writing. Um, there's a game some guys at our local shop play called the Wild West Exodus. And in that, there's a rule that you pretty much imagine that all your models are cylinders extending up from the base. And if anything, arms are sticking out from the sides or anything above the head, you don't count that for line of sight. And yeah. we're pretty, we, we play pretty lenient with line of sight if uh we play mainly you see his torso you're good you see a little sword you're not good and uh yeah i mean that's kid. exactly the common sense way i don't think i really we really haven't had much of a problem with it like can you see the model the model uh, i had an individual who was like nope i can see a, a weapon and i'm like that ain't right. The, yeah, uh, I mean, the guys at the shop the 40k guys uh, they kind of say it in jest they're so like i can see his foot through the window as as any sure. kind, of, any kind of joke in any certain scenario. Can you see him? Yeah, foot through the window. Yeah, I mean exactly. It's like, I, especially with my penchant for building overtly tall models, right? Like mm -hmm. that, I always have people up on things. Oftentimes, I'll have actually like you know the people I play against are, who are good guys will be like, you know, well I can kind of see the top of a sword sticking up, but you've got that model sitting on like a two inch tall thing, and it's a one inch tall model, so. And it's holding its sword up in the air. Yeah. So no, you know, no, I can't. I can't see the model. Yeah. Right. They can common sense look at it and go. There, there's there's other ways to win. And if somebody goes through the trouble trying to put something in line of sight, I always usually just ask or tell them, "Hey, I can see that. I I see what you're trying to do." Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah. that's what like when I'm moving, I ask like, "Okay, help me out. Can you see this yeah, right from where your where your models are? Can you see this?" Making it part of the as we've said so many times, making it part of the discussion early is the way to avoid yeah. arguments later. Yep. <laughs> yep. Being right. transparent with what you're doing. So that you're not trying to be sneaky. Yeah, yep. and this will come up. This will come up again later in the show too. <laughs> That's good. It's good. All right. Um, so what else we got? Just this weekend, we have uh, we have the Ideneth release. The book uh, is, is dropping. 136 pages, 14 war scrolls, four battalions, one piece of scenery, three lists of relics. So three items. Like three lists of items, and there are a ton of one-time use items in that list. There are six enclaves, which are basically uh, like your temples that from uh, daughters or from your sky porch from KO, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so that's uh, and then obviously we're getting the archers, the blind shooty archers and a duel uh, and the dual kit thing. Um, the other rumor I want to just briefly mention that I stumbled upon today um, before we wrap up the news is um, somebody had talked about how they got to, uh, two pieces of news that were related from the same source. Uh, the first one is a 40k piece of news, which um, isn't that uh, significant for us, and that's just simply that Russ is coming, like one of the Primarchs or whatever, is coming this summer. Um, but the more significant news piece to this is that w they also said, in addition to Russ coming this summer, this October we'll be we'll see a, re uh, a Slanesh release with Fulgrim and the whole like Slanesh crew. Um, and why um, I'm mentioning the Russ is that. Um, he will be an early litmus test for us to see if that if that um, I'm mentioning it now so we remember it. So when Russ drops in the summer, if he does, then that could help us predict potentially Slanesh in October because these these two rumors came from the same source. So um, and Vince, you've been predicting Slanesh for October for a while. I have. It's it's the time that makes the most sense. Um, we've had multiple Malign Portent stories talking about Slanesh. We're in the middle of a bunch of elf releases. Yep. Uh, all the elves have to do with Slanesh, right? Yep. Um, we've had a conversation with Marathi and Malarian openly saying, if this thing happens or goes sideways, Slanesh gets free. We can't stop that, right? It's beyond our ability to stop. Well, guess what? When they say that, you ever seen a movie? Like ever? Like <laughs> any movie? This is called foreshadowing. Yeah, like what happens when you've got a bunch of characters sitting around at the beginning? They're like, if those two storms come up the coast at the same time, we'll have a perfect storm. You know, like it's just, yes, that's what this movie's called. So um, it's going to happen. 
And, and so, like, obviously, it all makes sense. Nurgle should have basically been last year, anyways. So that means that this year is we we'll, we can get Slanesh. I've never bought the like one year limit, anyways. That's silly. They're you know whatever. That's such an artificial barrier that GW would in no way heed. Right, like every time you try to like say this is the grid pattern they're gonna follow, they're, they're like, like ah, nope, got you, bitch. Yeah, forget that. We're gonna do a dead book and some Nurgle, and then throw two elves at you and whatever. Then we're gonna reset the magic system and then do another death thing. Then more Stormcast, but doom. Like, yeah, shut up. Like they're not. It's not how they operate, right? They don't put a grid up on the wall, on the whiteboard, and be like, well, now we're gonna fill this slot. Yeah, and, and to be clear, I think slot. what my prediction is is that this will be the result of malign Borden. So this yes. will. Inclusion of rely importance will be no matter what else happens, Slanesh probably is freed. Um, yep. Whether another chaos god like rises in ascendancy and then you know Slanesh gets all offended by it or what, you know, whatever that looks like, Slanesh will probably be free this fall, which would then potentially set up the next narrative transition for if we like that would give rise or reason for both Malarian and uh, Tech or not oh, Malarian, Techless, and Tyrion to get their hands dirty. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, all that could come together over some amount of time. I suspect that they'll probably leave Malarian on the sidelines for a little while would be my particular guess. Oh, yeah. Because know. we'll have had two Dark Elf releases. Yeah, it's more interesting to leave him in, in reserve, as it were, and see what you want to do with him later. And like, get them Angel Elves out. Right? Like, they were already yeah, very I, I clear. <laughs> I, know where your, I know where your head's at, Vince. Well, they were already very clear in the doc book about what Tyrion and Tab, what the twins have been working on, right? And yeah. their their race. And we're already talking in the in the Edeneth book about the failed recreations of Teclas. Well, he didn't stop there. And by the way, the, I love that the Edeneth book is just like it is like a living story that Teclas is a terrible person or elf. He's just a horrible, horrible individual. How he's bad at everything he does. So you want to know awful. what would be the true horror story here, Vince? Sure. Is if we only have half the story. Like we have an like a unreliable narrator in that sense. Everybody in this story should be considered an unreliable right. narrator. Well, I'm saying with regard to the Aiden. Because what we know is that they like many of them are born without souls. Sure. What if <laughs> what if Techless created them and is just stealing their souls and using it to power their the super good elves? Hey, I would love that too. That'd be great. Sure. <laughs> so like, they're, that's they're, why. Yeah. That, that's why. Is that that curse is actually like a siphoning in order to empower the creation of the next generation. I dig it. How yeah. how dark would that be? It's totally within Teclis's character. He would completely do that. He's a guy who gambled the old world and lost. So, and what, you know. What kind, of, what kind of person would that elf be? The angel elf who is powered by souls and knows it. Would well, they uh, feel really good true. about themselves or feel real shitty about themselves? I'm saying they wouldn't know, and that would be the great lie. Like, that would be a wonderful thing to That's reveal. The they lie. think that yeah. they're pristine, but they actually don't know how the true horror of their creation. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's dark. And it's, yeah, it fits. Yeah. Darkness juxtaposed with just beautiful angel wings and white uh -huh. wing armor. Uh huh. Yep. I think that would be fantastic so hey i hope that all co that's a great idea tom boy oh boy if that turned out to be true i'd give you full credit and full marks for that call but i i would love to see a story like that yeah oh it'd be dark it'd be good though it'd be good so but yes i mean the slanesh release being in october is exactly when i would expect it they can mess around with both 40k and uh and with fantasy they can do full grum or whatever they want they can you know there's all sorts of things they can do uh, Velotron, by the way, uh, Vince already called what the new Slanesh is going to be, and it's going to be Leather Daddies. That's correct. Oh, yeah. Muscle-bound biker <laughs> Leather Daddies. Get ready. That's the new style. Get get into it. It's going to be like the village people exploded over Hellraiser. Or, yeah, Hellraiser. Yeah, Hellraiser. Yeah, yeah. all those spinies. <laughs> I, had to, I had to make sure I had my right horror movie. Yeah, th with the Cenobites. Yes. Yep. No, I'm in. Like yeah, I'm not in for that. I don't. I'm not going to paint that. Oh, but I'm, I'm just that. saying that I'm like I know that that that's probably that's probably true. Uh, yep, yep. Oh, uh, that's the news. All right, rock on. So, uh, gentlemen, let's do a little pick of the week. So, what what uh, video blog podcast whatever would you like to share with everybody? Uh, Andrew, why don't you kick us off, man? Let's just do the gamer motivation model on the Quantic Foundry website. 
That's a good yeah, website. Yeah. You can go on and you can take your quiz and you can look at your motivational categories. Uh, the other thing I wanted to share, a doctor from Cleveland came to the institute that I'm at and shared there's a man named Ross Green who works with uh, children with behavioral problems. So I got this book called Lost at School. And I'm usually not one to say big extreme things, but that day was the most mm. informative, influential day of my education that I've ever had. If I had to pick one day to have not missed in my whole career, that was the day to not miss. Uh, this program is called Plan B or CPS, Collaborative Proactive Solutions for working with children with lagging skills and unsolved problems. And to give you just a little research to back it up, Dr. Green trained in Maryland two hospitals. One, one hospital he trained, the, one was a control group and one hospital he trained in plan B. Every member of the staff, like even the cooks and the orderlies, doctors, visiting social workers, et cetera. And they checked their rate of restraints on children. Uh, restraints being having to physically restrain a child or tie a child down because they're hurting themselves or hurting others or chemical restraints, a sedative or seclusion restraints. Uh, this hospital had over a thousand restraints and after instituting plan B, 12 in a year, yeah. down to 12. That's, uh, that's a pretty good uh, reduction. I can do math. Thing at a jail, mm -hmm. a uh, juvenile detention facility, AKA baby jail and had one that was a control and one same thing, went in and trained them all in this CPS, Collaborative Proactive Solutions. The recidivism rate in both of these jails was about 93% or higher, which is par for the course in America. And the recidivism rate dropped in the Plan B group from 96% or 93% to 26%. Mm. Good Lord. They, they closed it. They closed the jail. They said, we don't need this anymore. Is uh, the book on Amazon? Yeah, books on Amazon, lost at school. Actually, this book is so good. Um, first person in the comment who's a parent who wants this book, who thinks they can use it, I'll buy it for you. Because it's quite an offer. All right, rock and roll. Wonderful. Yeah, so let me know who says it first. Vin I'll track it. Watching. I'll watch. Yeah, great, great stuff. Inspiring stuff. Really great woman from Cleveland. She was a pediatrician. She knew her biology, neuroscience, practicing physician, uh, knew her developmental psychology, and came to give us lecture on this plan B and uh, very inspiring. So I hope to do it my own work. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, I will link the first thing you mentioned, the gamer motivation motivation in the comments. I'll also link the, the book out there because that seems really cool. Uh, and so we'll do it in the comments after the show. So that way everybody has a chance at it. So you have to, everybody's got some first person to comment in like the comments down here, yeah. not as you're watching it yeah. over the side. That way I have a permanent record of it because the problem is with the scrolling comments, they go away. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay, cool, man. That's awesome. Uh, I did take my little motivation test by the way, earlier today. I know Tom did too. So we've got our, uh, results. We're ready. We're ready to have this conversation. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but we'll get there. I'm going to win this conversation. <laughs> that says everything right there. Sure. <laughs> All right. So Tommy, what about you, man? What's your pick? What would you like to share with everybody? Yeah, um, good old friend of the show, Paul Conti, did a service for everybody um, and hosted a pain episode last Friday night. Um, and if you want to hear discussion about everything, I didn't uh, probably a lot of inappropriate stuff. Paul's probably never going to make money on any of his videos again from ads um, because of this video. Uh, go check it out. It's a great pain episode. Great way to fill some airtime. Uh, Vince and myself were on there. Ryan Price, uh, ex uh, Oz Hammer uh, of ex Oz Hammer fame, and Dez, and a whole bunch of other folks were on there. Um, and it was uh, it was a blast. So I'd encourage you to, to check it out and support Paul. Nice uh, for myself. Uh, if you're if you're hungering for some Edeneth Deepkin, and uh, you know you haven't got your book yet, you want to re read a little deep dive review. Shout out to uh, to our, our good friend Tyler Mengel who put his full review up, and uh, I have seen commentary that it's uh, it is a, an excellent review for many people, including people um, who sort of are in 
you know, kind of the Eden S chat. Everybody loved it. So I was really happy to see that. Uh, I read it. I thought it was an awesome breakdown of sort of their abilities and how it works in general and kind of the, what you can expect to find in the book. So check that out. Uh, that is, will be linked down in the comments. As an aside, I forgot to mention this in the news. Um, it's not really pressing anymore, but I'll mention it anyways. Um, at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, oh, yeah, sure. Sign up for Holy Havoc. Uh, number three started. Um, and it's How could we not mention that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but like the reason why I didn't mention it initially is like it, it, I dropped off priority because before the show started, it, it had already been filled up. Yeah, yeah. Like it sold all of its tickets within like 30 to 45 minutes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that said, um, I want to encourage you all, if you're at all interested, even as a single player, if you do, even if you don't have a teammate, go and sign up for the wait list. Um, yep. Traditionally, anybody that signs up for the wait list, they've always been able to get into one of the holy events. Holy Wars, Holy Havoc. Um, and so that's something that interests you. Please go sign up because you can still get in. Vince and I will definitely be there. We're going to be rolling some daughters. Um, as I said before, somebody was like, there's going to be blood in the water. You say, obviously, I didn't have reference. And I'm like, oh, there's going to be blood. All right. We're going to bring the blood and a bunch of dead fish, man. That's what's going to happen. Definitely want to bring snakes. So you rid of them. Time to just just call me Quint. All right. Because we're going hunting. So that's all I got to say about that. You all know who I am and what I do. Uh, I'll get you the tail, the teeth, the whole damn thing. So, um, yeah. My uh, so that's my pick of the week. So let's uh, let's turn to some hobby time. So as Andrew walked away to probably go grab what he's working on, <laughs> my daughter Andrew lost something I was getting it for. You're okay. So what are you working on, man? What's on your table? Uh, Skaven. Let me get him. You go get him while we're waiting for him to get him. There you go. That's quick. Oh, still getting him. <laughs> I, I was tremendously thrilled to play against uh, Wayne Kemp at Adepticon uh -huh. after my buddy had shown me his tweet of his Skaven army because I have been working on a similar kind of thing. This old school... Like classic. classic. Nice. So here they are. Look at that edge. Look at the edge. It looks great. Oh, yeah. It's so green. It's green. It's so green. Check it out. They it's come so right classic. Here. That's fantastic. Here Here's the, where's the book man? The book man says all is rot in the book. Ah, they're green and they're pink. And uh, classic, uh, here, here's my vermin lord. Yep. Oh, that guy. <laughs> uh, the base is a little big. He looks kind of stupid. I finished. He's got, a, he's got a lot of space to really spread out, really he, use. He's turned illegal though. Yeah. Finish up this thing. Mm -hmm. Nice. And then, uh, my allies in this list that are very good are these things. I like these a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, they are. And I run these and a Arch Warlock and a Bailwind Vortex, which is best artillery in the game. <laughs> and then my priests are these old metal models like this. So I'm yep. working on these. I got about eh, 30 rats out of uh, 140 done. That's pretty good. Yeah, they're going quick. I'm using some fillers too. I put the bell in there. It just it needs some visual interest. Can't do the same rats all the time. Sure. But uh, yeah, I got, yeah, I got a nice variety. I got some old old storm vermin, old Skaven slaves, all those original Marauder ones from uh, like '88, '89. Sure. So I was inspired after Adepticon to get back and start working on these guys. Yeah, Wayne's old school Skaven was a great looking army. He did an awesome yeah. job with it. Um, I don't have much of that. The only ones I kept, ironically, are the old, um, because like I, I canned and sold off all my old Skaven to buy the new Skaven, with the exemption of the old Doom Wheel. I still have one of my old Doom Wheels mm -hmm. and the old Plague uh, Monks, which I think the old Plague Monks are better than the new ones. It's one of the few sculpts yeah. that I think mm -hmm. is I like that. legitimately the old one was better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got, I got about I think sixty of the new ones, and then whatever else, like 60 metal ones. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, as would befit a Pestilence army. Um, the only thing I love in the new plastics for Plague Monks are the tiny stabbers that come on the Plague Monks sprues yeah. for, like, no little reason. Those little those little things? Yeah, I don't know what they are or why they're there, but they're they awesome. They a, a glockenspiel. Yeah, they're just... Out, coming out and stabbing stuff. 
Yeah, they're little like little homunculus scaven. Like they're so tiny. Oh, uh, there it is. I got it. You do a dual scene. You do a dual scene between the baby monk and <laughs> sure. like for the golden demon. A very tiny, tiny dual scene. Or you could do uh because it looks like he's like summoning magic. You could do the Lord of Change on a mini Balewind vortex, like a sure. like a two inch mil, mil, uh, bail one. Oh. Well, it, like do the whole dual scene on like a fifty mil base. <laughs> Just that would be the whole thing. You just itty bitty. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, so I'm working on that. And then I'm working on uh, just like a, maybe a competition piece, upping my skills, trying to put everything I've learned to the test. I bought this at Adepticon too. Mm. It was like 25 bucks. So there he is with his uh, awesome gross face. Not sure how I feel about the green power sword. I might switch it to bone, but got the head done, and I'm pretty happy with how it's looking. I'll go in and put some kick colors and glazes in later on the head. And he's uh, well, he's got the head of a sister of battle in there, Vince. It's unacceptable. Yeah. This thing has to be purged immediately. <laughs> so we're gonna do like an old school uh, more fire exploitation B cult movie kind of tyranny of the brood, bright colors kind of thing. Yeah, that's, that's uh my table. Very nice. Well, I was with you until you had the sister of Battlehead. Now that just became heresy. <laughs> it must be expunged with all with all uh with all immediacy. All right. Tommy, what about you, man? What are you working um, on? I would say okay, so what have I been doing? Um for most of the week, uh I've been doing this, and you can see some of it. There are holes up here. There's, yeah, your shelf isn't literally overflowing. Little holes right here. Everybody see the holes down here? Made some, some great progress today, Tom. I'm uh, I'm purging. <laughs> the purge is happening in my house. Sure. It's officially uh, on. It's officially on, and there's a lot of plastic that's, you know, you guys were talking about selling old stuff, and I have, uh, like, all of my pestilence stuff is going to the, uh, is going up for sale. You got any metal and, stuff? No, it's all plastic. It's like the big, the big plastic box with like the Vermin Lord and the like the the one of the early army boxes for AOS. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just lots of stuff. I have a corn army going up. I have uh, Swift Talk Agents army going up. Yeah. Um, I w I tried to make that army and they nixed that battalion. I tried. I know. I'm. You have no idea how sour I am about that. Um, <laughs> Sour and, enough to sell his Swift Hawks. That's how sour all, it is. all of them are going. Um, yeah, anyway, so I'm moving a lot of stuff. Uh, just it's not necessarily for a project, I'm just making some space, doing some spring cleaning. Um, and uh, and then I've been drilling holes in the bases of uh, witch elves to put some pins in. Okay, so just, li just a little bit of hobby here and there. Just uh, I came off of a pretty uh, intense season on those KO, and I'm just kind of easing my way back into uh, into sure. my projects. By the way, I cut all my, like, uh, like I did sisters or whatever, you know, for the first group. Yep. I cut all of them off those jumpy rocks. All of them. It's just their feet. Like, I, I, they're all on just their feet. I got, I cut, I gutted every one of them off of those jumpy rocks. No random jumpy rocks on my bases. No, 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 no. I don't want to, and no part of that. It's a hard pass. It's a hard pass. All right. Uh, no thanks. I I'd, I'd have 120 to do. Sure, I get it. Uh, somebody asked in the comments where you're selling your stuff. You can like share your name on eBay if you want to or whatever. You can just uh, uh, yeah. So um, it's uh, use is it? No, it's uh, Type it. Key Lions Type it. Or, Don't, don't say it. it. Type it. Nobody's gonna know. And then and then you can if somebody's curious wants to follow Tom. Yeah. Oh, I can. You can send it to me, Tom, and I'll put it in the show notes if you want it there. I mean, um, what he puts all this stuff up, or you can just leave a comment about some of the stuff he mentioned, and he can you can reach out to him directly, or hit him up on Twitter. Yeah, that's that would be that. All those would be better than than buying it off of eBay when I post it because I get more money then. <laughs> <laughs> like I can lower the price. Wait, a, there you go. Now you're seeing yeah. Tom. Now you're getting higher for, for you. So I could get you. more money. It's not that's not great salesmanship, Tom. I can not, give you a I'm better deal. Sell, I'm not trying to make money off of our viewers. Like that's why, like that's not what I'm trying to do here. I understand. So, um, if I was, I'd be like, visit my eBay store, but I'm not. Sure. Um, so no, just hit me up and like I'll, I'm more than willing to share, um, what you know what I'm what I'm interested in moving. So, 
All right. Uh, how many uh, of those dumb Swift Talk chariots did you have, by the way? <laughs> I had three left new in box. Um, I had four at one point in time, but I gave one to Mitch. Gotcha. Okay. I was gonna say I thought you had four of those things. I did have four at one point in time, but I got but I got some good deals. What how do you say no? You're like it's gonna be uh, like you look at it and go, that's a stupid swift talk chariot. I don't it unless was 25 you're, bucks a, a chariot. That is twenty four dollars and ninety nine cents too much. You were insane. Uh, they are sixty dollar boxes. Cool. Cool. <laughs> cool. Uh for myself, uh I finished up my um Shadespire orcs. I'm just waiting on their little display base, but I'll put up the pictures tomorrow. But they're all ready to go. Um, so got that little, got the crew. You stayed ready. with that terrible color scheme, and you're gonna try to win a golden demon with that. Yeah, I stayed with that color scheme. That is correct. Um, I That's you, such the wrong choice. Well, you can shut your dumb face. You are 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 any are all of them armored, or do any have open faces? Uh, no, there are, well, the, every one of their faces is different. Um, so right. you can see he has the half face, right? He has the lower right. jaw. Yeah. See, that's um, the problem, Vince. When I look at your model, I can't tell the difference between the head and the jaw. Well, in like this, armor. this is very washed out color. In reality, it's very easy to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. He's got like a big metal plate on his head. Darren Watson then, or one of the other judges is going to look at that and be like, it's terrible. That is bad color choice. I'm sure they will. And that's fine. I'd still rather paint what I enjoy and love than try to, than not. And then he's the only one with the full normal face, but yeah. all their faces are different. So uh, I'm not ready to go. put that down. You know that, right? I don't care. I've I know what I have chosen, and I'm happy with my choice. So there you go. All well, faces should be green. Uh, they should most definitely not. That would be wrong. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I will. Uh, those pictures will go up tomorrow, and of course, because there's no rest for the wicked. Uh, now that we got those done, uh, it's time to move on to these girls. So I just got these started before the show tonight. Um, these are the, obviously the Canary. Which one are these? These are the throwy ones. Those are the ones I'm doing. But again, normal faces. Not, heart renders. Yeah, the heart renders. Thank you. The like I still use the normal L faces because I'll use the L faces for everything. I don't like really like the mask faces. Other than this unit champ who has like the sweet ninja mask face. Mm. Right? Which is like super cool. So um, are, other than that. Yeah, yeah I haven't, I haven't, I haven't bought any of those kits. Yeah clash with the aesthetic of the whole army i did not care for those for which ones i didn't care for those masks on those models i thought it really didn't make a lot of sense to me i i agree i don't like the masks on the snakes or on the canary like the gorgon style black you know gold masks um i used the mask for the unit champions in all of these because i think it, it helps the champion stand out yeah right and so i don't mind it in that regard as as a one-off but the rest should be elves because then you kind of get the feeling that it's like it's definitely an elf wearing a mask when the other four in the unit all look like normal elves. Right. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I, yeah, like I, I hadn't thought about it, but, um, yeah, I'm gonna have to look at those boxes, uh, just because I agree, but you didn't use any of the sisters faces. Did you like, you didn't use any of the, uh, um, the metal faces. Same thing with my sisters of slaughter. There's one. Right there's I used one metal mask and I still put the hair coming out of it um, hmm. as opposed to hmm. just the like baldy mask. Right. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, like. I just like my sisters of slaughter are easily identifiable enough to me. They're the one with the champion who has the metal face mask and and they all have whips and and daggers instead of double daggers. Right. Yeah. Like it's those whips yeah. are pretty telling like they're armed correctly. Um, same with these girls, like they're armed with the throwy spears, not with the, you know, not with yeah. the little hooky, hooky Does sights. Normally, do all of them normally have masks or just the javelins have masks and the melee ones have? No, the melee ones use the elf heads normally. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> the melee ones use the elf the heads. Like the close the... combat ones should be using the more armored faces, maybe. I don't know. Right. In the in the snakes, that's true. In the snakes, the um, in the snakes, the melee ones use the masks by wow. the default build, and the shooty sisters use the elf faces. Hmm. So there you go. Uh yeah. So there you go. That's that. And uh, I'm gonna do a 
video hopefully on painting with pink skin i already started recording everything i did with my airbrush and then i'll get into the brush so that way um people can have a, a so i'll do a tutorial on the pink sort of pink skin pink demon skin so there you go assuming i still have my voice tomorrow we'll see how that works out uh okay so that's hobby time let's talk about some gamer motivation shall we so I think that, uh, you know, the very first question, that, you know, we had talked about in the agenda when we were talking this through was sort of, you know, inspired by uh, our good friend Tyler Emerson. It was the discussion of sort of why, why Warhammer, right? In other words, like the why of Warhammer. Mm -hmm. So Andrew, you want to kind of tackle that one right out of the gate? You want to, you want to give some thoughts on that? Yeah, we'll go into detail on that gamer motivation models. But first, I have the same story that most people have of being around 10 to 12 years old and seeing those magical miniatures in the hobby shop with those bright colored boxes of Games Workshop and eventually deciding to buy them. And for whatever reason, I had enough grit or tenacity to get through the Warhammer 40K 3rd Edition rule book <laughs> at 12 years old. I read the whole thing. And I purchased the Tyranid Army. Uh, this must have been 1999 or 2000, maybe. Um, I've always been an artist. Even as a child, I was an artist. So I was really drawn to this. But I also recall making just the filthiest, filthiest lists as a 12-year-old. Just trying to <laughs> rig the system and spam. I put the adrenal glands on the backs of my... Uh, which ones are the ones with the shooting termagants or hormagants? One of them with the shooting, so they could just pump out like ten shots each per turn, run across the board, and rain filth down on your opponents. Uh, I also fell in love with the lore of 40k, uh, so I was just hooked on pretty much all three aspects of the game. Um, I I made my themed aliens army. I had seen the movie Alien, and I uh, I got those Tyranids. I didn't know how to paint. I did not prime them. I just put BCO Brown on them, dunked them in chestnut ink, dunked them in red ink. And then I, uh, with my dad, he helped me with this like toxic, like stain for a deck that would make them look all glossy and extra brown, which I covered in hot glue and painted red to be extra bloody. And that was my Tyranids army. Uh, and I've been hooked. For a couple years after that, I can't say ever since. I've uh, it, Every three years or so, I would go on Games Workshop and look at the armies and consider buying back into the game. And I'd do some math and think, I don't have $600 right now to get back into this. <laughs> um, sure. And uh, I got into board games maybe in 2012, 2013. So I played a lot of Euro games and train games and economic games. And... Uh, one year at Gen Con, I just decided to buy a starter set. It was pretty cheap. Bought some paints, got back into it, and I have painted every day since then. Uh, I love all of it, man. I love making lists. I love playing the game. I, uh, I The lore is okay right now. I don't think it's as good as it was. Um, I do appreciate the Sigmar lore and how wacky and huge it is. I like the creation myths. And I like the big ridiculous things that happen. Uh, but if you're talking like a, a sentence by sentence basis, most of Warhammer, it seems like it was written by a committee of seventh graders, which is probably why I loved it so much as a seventh grader. Sure, sure. But I still enjoy it. I think it's a rich, vivid world, especially 40K, uh, mm. which I don't play, ironically. Uh, <laughs> but Sigmar is a great game, man. And, uh, we can go into specific details about gamer motivations if you guys are ready to tackle this motivation model. Let's do, do it, it, man. Absolutely. Okay, so this company, Quantic Foundry, which uh, Vince will link in the show notes, made already down there. gamer motivational model. So this company is like, uh, as I understand it, they're a marketing company and they're focused on gamers. And I don't know if they were paid to do this or if they did this as part of their uh, how they get their customers by building this model. But they got something like... 300,000 people to get a, to build these models and they came up with six categories that any reason why you're going to play a game can fit into one of these six categories. Well, that was that's for the video game one, right? 
the, re yeah. the reason why I ask is the board game, like, so this, the, well, like, I took both, and, the, like, one has four categories, and the other has six. Yeah, I, th I really like the six. I think okay. the six, um, because the six are each divided into two, it really covers almost anything. And, um, it's, it, you know, with the, with the board game ones, you're not going to find much that fit in the achievement category, but it's right. still there. So I've really, I've really settled on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it applies to Warhammer as well, uh, which is what we'll do in the second part. So I'll go through it. I'll take us through each of these, uh, six motivational categories, and then we can together apply them to Warhammer and figure out which ones we think Warhammer does well and which ones might be lacking. Uh, but ultimately, do you have, um, do you have, do you want to share it? If not, I have it brought up and I can bring it up on my screen and share yeah, it. You can bring it up on your screen. Just the, the six. So and people can see what we're talking about here. But anyhow. that's the one. All right. Go. Action. This could also be called drama. Um, in board games, this is your Ameritrash gamer, if you know that phrase. Mm -hmm. uh, this is your dice roller who likes to see things explode. This player will like games whose central design tenant is excitement, um, which can often come at the expense of balance or fairness. But that's fine to these players. Uh, so we have two categories here, destruction and excitement. You know, these, these players want a game that's fast-paced. They want thrills and they will not enjoy maybe a slow game so much as a fast paced one. Mm. Now there, there's things you can do to try to, um, because I'm a chess player, if you can tell, and I find long chess games to be very exciting. Um, even though nothing is exploding because there is drama going on. You just have to, really focus in on it to think about it. Yeah. Well, let really me where, like where can, the battle is taking place. Sure. If I can lever a Delta here. Yeah. Um, so I recorded a video a while back about the difference between suspense and surprise. Okay. Yeah. And chess has a high level. So it's probably actually easier if we move this over to sports because sports is mm -hmm. an easy way to think about it. Um, soccer and hockey, two sports that aren't traditionally the most popular in America are like all suspense, right? Yeah. Because if you think about it, the ball is constantly in motion. They have very few timeouts and it can always just send, or the, or the puck if you're talking hockey, but you get what I mean, right? It's going back and forth. There's always like, think about how many times you get like, oh, 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 oh. That's the whole sound of both of those games. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and whereas surprise is something like American football. Yeah. Right? Where like all of a sudden you'll land a 50 yard, uh, Hail Mary pass and boom, or the runner will break free and run for the TD, right? That's a surprise, right? Right? It just things happen, they turn on a dime and sun or, or a, a sudden interception and so on and so forth, right? Yeah. Like, so the, the first category that action, when I think about it in psychographic profile surprise. terms, it's a very Timmy category and it favors surprise, it favors the unexpected, yep. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great addition. Surprise. Yep, the action uh, motivated player will love surprise. Uh, social. Social is next. Uh, the player with the social motivations enjoys games as, you know, it's kind of like drinking. It's a social lubricant. Uh, we get together and we play together and we're engaging together over this shared um thinking experience really games are about thinking and about making choices so we get together and we think and through that we get closer to one another they care more about that getting close to each other than they do about the content or the structure of the game experience uh so a game that encourages this kind of experience would be something like uh one night ultimate werewolf or resistance you know, those games are usually called social games yep. uh, as their their tagline. Um, they do have that's that's really the community aspect. They do also have competition aspect here. Um, chess players, I think, feel like you really get to know somebody by sitting in complete silence with them and just letting your moves do the talking. And I found you can really learn a lot about how people solve problems by playing games like this, by just watching the decisions that they make. Um, 
there's a sort of camaraderie that's built through high level competition and a sort of, uh, everything has a scene, right? Uh, and especially in Warhammer, we, we learn the people who show up to all the tournaments and we like to see them. And same thing goes with a chess tournament, high level chess. Oh, who are you playing against? Oh, I got this guy in the pairing. So it's not going to be good. Oh, he plays this opening. What do you think? Have you beat him before? I played this sideline against him. Oh, you, I booked up on my night or defense. I'm ready to go. Uh, society is created through the game experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think war games in general, this is this is like such obviously a huge part of it. We'll bring it down to Warhammer specifically or whatever eventually. But obviously, I mean, if you've ever been to any large convention and you see the communities that evolve around a competition, right? Like it is literally these two aspects. The convention, which is a community gathering, is an excuse to have a competition, which right. is an excuse to bring the community together. Great. Right. It is literally like this. In are a manifestation of this quality. Form one another. Yeah. yeah. And and that might be the only chance that one convention might be the only chance those people have all year to actually like play that game with other people who also appreciate that game. Right? If it's very niche. So yeah. War uh, master being among those. <laughs> sure. And then so, so games like video games that will do this are your MMOs, uh, world right. of Warcraft, most definitely. Um, I'd also argue, uh, world of Warcraft does, all of these very well, uh, which is why it's so popular. Uh, but so does Warhammer, and we're talking about Warhammer today. Mastery is the next category. Mm. Uh, the mastery player uh, typically wants a low luck game that has some kind of justice to it. So chess and, and Go are the perfect examples. Um, you're playing against a player, not the game. The These players don't like when a game system can screw you over. They want a game that can be studied and your own play can be improved upon and high-level strategy, high-level tactics. Um, games should be about players' abilities, not about battling against the game. The yeah, to, to take it out of the sort of like war games thing completely, I think this one's easy when you put it up against... When you think of like you go to Vegas with somebody, mm -hmm. right? Who goes to the poker table yep. and who goes to the roulette wheel? Yep. Right? One of these you can improve upon. One of these you really yep. can't. Right? Well, they try at the casino, they try to make it so you can't improve upon one of them. Sure. Uh, they make it hard. Uh, so we have challenge and strategy here. Challenge being like, what what can I what can I do? What can I accomplish? Uh, I don't I don't want it, I don't want it to be easy. Uh, and then um, strategy, how can I practice and can I get better at it? Uh, this person is really, uh, uh, they, they want that part of being a human being. All human beings like to practice and self-perfect and get better at things. And they, they really get inspired. That dopamine releases when they're getting better and seeing how, how far they've come. Um, if the game system has a lot of randomness, this player will often not want to play because it'll break that that sense of fairness. Um, they want the player who's, who works harder and studies and practices more and understands the game better and, of course, plays the position better. You can have an off day and lose even if you're the better player. Uh, should win. Uh, if they do not due to some factor of the game, well, maybe you get upset. You you get frustrated. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's easier to lose to an opponent who is better than you than it is to lose to some nonsense within a game system. Right, where you didn't have control over, right. While that's true, like, let me... So a lot of people are probably thinking about this and framing it with regard to Warhammer. Yeah. Um, and with kind of the double turning and all that stuff, but, like, as someone who, who um, self-disclosing is probably high... Who, not is probably, is high in this category of like mastery challenge strategy uh, you can still see like, not that you're good at it this is just a thing you enjoy <laughs> yeah, they, yeah yeah let's be very clear yeah i'm yeah. not saying that i'm a master but rather um it, that you find this motivating that i find it motivating and sure. i find it enjoyable for those that who invest this direction um and those that do work to self-perfect like a lot of the really good players let me let me remove myself from this a lot of the really good players, when watching a match, can see from the very get-go that the game is over. Mm -hmm. So, for example, 
Um, I was, uh, this is not bagging on anybody specifically, but just I was watching the game today on Warhammer Live with a KO list and the Ideneth list. And I was messaging with Gary Percival. Gary Percival is a fantastically competent player who has done very well. Um, not the least of which is in the recent uh, uh, heat this last weekend did very well. Sure. Mr. Clown Car himself. Mr. Clown Car himself. Um, the reality is, is that like in our chat, like it was very clear from the top of one, the game was over <laughs> because a single move, it sounds really silly, but a single move made it so that like he halved his points. He, the individual allowed the one ob objective to get taken from at the top of one, one of the two objectives. And then at that point it was really a downhill battle because of a variety of factors of lists of matchups of all the other stuff. The game realistically, and sure enough, like that's the way it went. And there really wasn't a turning it around at this point. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and so like folks that will major in mastery will see the battlefield, even when there are a bunch of random factors and can see when yes. the game is, is over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so. true. And that, that, that is why Warhammer works as this, because uh, the good player will win. They just won't win. 100% of the time due to those dice. Right, right. Yep. They can uh, increase their odds, but they can't yeah. get to that one. Which just yeah. has to do with, I guess, the, the granularity, I guess, of the amount of luck in a game. Yep, uh, yep. This player will also hate, like, take that games where there's some sort of, like, unearned, I hurt you because I drew a card and I didn't make any decisions or do any work to be able to hurt you. That will really infuriate the mastery player. Mm. Um Next up is achievement. This one we can do pretty quick. This is your classic like leveling up structure. Um, any RPG is going to have achievement. Uh, any game which rewards progression is based off achievement. Uh, this can also be like collecting things, uh, getting a hundred percent, conquering a game, or doing a speed run. Um, or in World of Warcraft, they literally added those things called achievements. Right. Uh, and WoW is a good example of this, and that you get to wear your achievements like your armor or even your your title over your head um when you get like the vp titles or you kill a big boss you get an extra title above your name um this is the one i identify the least with aside from mm. like, wanting to be able to brag about my chess rating uh well it's funny because like inside a game uh, yeah i don't i don't really like leveling up doesn't really get me sure like, it's interesting because within the scope of, of Warhammer, you know, we'll talk about it more as we dive through these and apply them, but I think this is one that has a really interesting alignment with unusual situations in Warhammer. It's there, but not in the way that a lot of these other ones are. Mm. So, mm. so um, immersion. Uh, this player wants, like, literature. They want cinema. They want their game to be cinematic, and they want to go into another world and explore that world and have it be as vivid as the real world. Um, now it's important to note here, immersion, the kinds of stories that a player will be attracted to is going to vary from person to person. And that's why there are so many RPG systems. Right. I, for instance, really love Torchbearer. I can't stand D and D. I like low magic. I like stories about people suffering and grittiness. <laughs> uh, I can't, st I don't like heroes. I don't like wizards throwing fireballs. Like I like magic to really hurt you just for doing a little like snap your fingers does sparks and you get cancer the uh, go, go into battle with a with a goblin with a knife and maybe you never come out just like 1v1 you're dead um but both of those are still immersion and you will go to the system you're attracted to that can meet your story needs as well as your gameplay needs um so immersion player favorite video game might be planescape torment uh, favorite board game sure. might be Pandemic Legacy, which uh, follows the, um, the the diseases taking control of the world and you're trying to fight them off. Um, so fantasy and story are the two there. Uh, fantasy meaning kind of escapism, going to another world, and story. Everybody loves stories. I think most people can really get behind story and immersion. And story can be um, like you're playing a part of the story, or story can be... Um, and like a high level strategy game that's created, like an abstract game can have a story to it of the drama of who's winning and who's losing at one point and who pulls out all the stops and plays well. 
Uh, last one is creativity. Yeah, this will be a big talking point of Warhammer. Um, but it's important not to think of just this as artistry, but creative uh, creativity can be in terms of discovery as well. It can also mean like customization. Um, so a magic player who builds a list or Tom, I know you build a lot of lists. Uh, that's cool. You're, you're creatively motivated. It, um, it can also include exploration like of a game world or of a game space or the person who's trying to break the game um, by finding like the best of most efficient uh, number of points or like uh, back in the day, we would spend hours playing Halo 2 trying to get out of the map and do glitches. Uh, that's creativity. That's exploration. Mm -hmm. uh, this player likes to experiment um, or find exploits or put a or change on a bale and vortex. Uh, that's it for the introduction. I think the next step is to go through and apply these to Warhammer and really, I think this is why Warhammer is such a good game because it can provide for all of these for people. And um, the goal here is to really give ourselves our own language to talk about why we play games. And after we apply the model to Warhammer, we'll talk about why this is a good thing to do to have this language, this shared language. So what do you guys think about um, action? We can just start over from the top. Sure. So, I mean, obviously this is a huge, obvious alignment, right? Like there's tons of things that speak to this. What I love is that there are elements even, obviously these things are siloed here in this, but they don't have to be necessarily. What I mean by that is these things often synergize together, right? Like the action synergizes with the immersion. Right. So when you have elements that bring those two together, you have somebody playing like corn and shouting out blood for the blood God. Right. Because yeah. some big thing just triggered and blew up a bunch. Oh, of I, I played against Jake Barry at Adepticon. I know it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great example of immersion plus action. Yes. Right? He, so, he bought an album for me on iTunes and played it. <laughs> I was like, where he's like, what do you want to listen to? And I was like, uh, sludge metal, electric wizard, funeralopolis. Let's do it. And he bought it and just blared it. Nice. And it, yeah, it was immersive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that all of these hit, right? It's easy to think of them like action. Sure, you roll dice, you get, you know, yep. an incredible roll. Something amazing happens in the game. You kill a big monster. You slay a hero. You blah, 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 blah. There's a hundred examples yes. of this, right? I think I think it works so well, um, especially in Age of Sigmar. Maybe not so much in 8th edition because uh, your victory condition was to not let things die. But now... Things it's die. To proactively do things. And right. You gotta you gotta trade your pieces off. They're gonna die, stuff's gonna explode, uh your maw crusher is gonna charge on a deadly terrain and destructive bulk off three units. It's sure. Uh, yep. And and that's that's very exciting that you're going in and you and, and the tactileness of rolling the dice. We cannot roll that rule that out as part of the, the game design. Yeah, and then, you know, I mean, obviously the social, we already talked about that, right, is a big part of Wargaming. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's a huge part of this. Obvi uh, you know, I, arguably where Warhammer has always been the strongest in both its its uh, its core competency has probably been immersion and the story and things like that, right? Not mastery. By that, what I mean is, like, Warhammer's always tended to be on the more random side of games, it's no one would ever confuse Warhammer with chess. This is all yeah, I mean, yeah. right? Right. That's not to say that there's not mastery there. That's not to say that challenge and strategy aren't important parts. If it wasn't, you would see random players at the top of tournaments, but you don't. You, yeah, you see yeah. good players usually in, in the top grouping. It doesn't mean the top spot, right? right. But in a top grouping. Yep. And th there's two things I think that lend really to the social aspect of Warhammer. The first being... We all respect a painted army. And when somebody puts a nice painted army in front of you and you look at it, you really know how much time they put into it. And just immediately, you feel like you can respect this person because they were able to complete that army. Um, and that's a great feeling to have two great armies going against each other and both of you knowing what each of you has, has done in order to get to that point, to that table where you are. And that, that really helps with the social. The, th the second thing that helps with the social is you, the game doesn't function if you are not social. Because right. chess has like 10 rules. Like a, a four-year-old can play chess. A four-year-old can't play Warhammer. Because Warhammer, imagine if you went to a chess board and there was like, I don't know how many War Scrolls there are, 700, 1,000? 
and, <laughs> and there, there are 700 possible pieces and you set up your 16 possible pieces on the front and then you just start playing. It would never work. You have to explain what each piece does to your opponent. So that metaphor here um, really shows the difference between those two kinds of games. Uh, you cannot play this game if you're not telling people what you're doing. You're forced to interact. And if you don't interact well and you're not polite, the game doesn't work. Uh, if you don't tell you the opponent what's going on, they don't have a good game. Yeah, I mean, it, it reminds me of, so, you know, we talked last week or one of the picks of the week was about Hey Woe Twitches, who was a previous MTG player talking about his first mm -hmm. uh, AOS tournament. And he talked that, about that's how... Cool. He's my primary gaming partner. Oh, there you go. Nice. nice. So, and yeah, he talked about how um, at a lot of Magic tournaments, people will sit across from each other, play the whole game, and basically not say much of anything. Yeah, because they don't have to. Right. Right. Whereas that would be extremely unusual. Um, but let me make a slight meta contextual point, perhaps. Yes. Um, achievement is the toughest one to square yeah. within the yes. scope of the game. However, yeah. let me argue that it is, in fact, one of the most critical elements to a particular slice of the gaming world. Okay. okay. Achievement is, in essence, the uh what we are trying to do at tournaments okay hmm. and there are two forms of achievement i think we all participate in one or, or to well to some degree or another uh one is collection you mentioned like you know the completion of things get all the collectibles there are obviously all of us have different levels of what we want to have as our collection for an army right, right. but we all know There's people who are like up here too yeah, we all know people who are like, I want to have all of this army in a massive number. Like, I have, you know, 13,000 plus points of Tomb Kings. That's There's a reason for that. I wanted it all. I we wanted did, nine. We had a guy at Adepticon who was, like, the most excited person there telling us about his 1,300 nobblers that he ran. Right. Yeah, ah, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, he came in, and Alex was like, hey, did you bring that damn nobbler list this year? <laughs> you're, you're not allowed in. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> he, was Alex, so curse you. he was just ecstatic to be telling us about this. Night. And his son came up and his son was like, oh, yeah, my dad's got 1300 nobblers, 800 of them are painted. <laughs> That's a, that is a heck of a that is an achievement. Wow. That is a heck of an achievement. Yes, absolutely. Um, but then here's my sort of meta point. Think about the way tournaments are generally awarded. Yeah. Okay. And I would argue that the achievement of winning awards at a tournament, each one is recognition within a selective category here. Yep. So, and I, because I don't want to restrict, when I say tournament, most people's minds immediately go to like, oh, it's battle points, hard engines, whack, it's this, blah, 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 blah. But that's not really mm -hmm. Warhammer tournaments, right? right? They recognize a broad spectrum of, ach of, of achievements. So and, we've mentioned Jacob Berry. Can I jump yeah. in real here real quick? Yes. Jacob yeah. goes to tournaments to win sportsmanship awards. Right. Like right. He he was very clear about that. And so his entire mindset going in is, how do I get best game votes in every game? How do I be a good, fun opponent, right? Right. That's so an like achievement he offered in the body social. The album. Yep. Like, yeah. he, like, he was, that was a way in which to engender goodwill. <laughs> uh, but that's achievement <laughs> in social. Right. Yep, Whereas yep. the battle points are achievement in mastery, yep, theoretically. Yes, right. Yep. And, and the your... painting is creativity. Exactly. That's a really nice. That's a great, great idea. It's a great thought. I think achievement can also be just getting a unit painted, man. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. A hundred percent. Like we've all experienced that achievement, right? Of like when you finish a unit, that's I mentioned the plague monks I still have earlier. Mm -hmm. Right. The reason I own those Plague Monks still, the reason I couldn't bring myself to get rid of them, really, in addition to liking the sculpts, because it's hard for me to separate the bias of how much I like them, but I know why I really have them. They were the first unit I ever finished painting in Warhammer. Right? Yeah. They were the first time I ever actually experienced that, what happens when you finish a unit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll never sell my Iron Jaws. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right, so next we have uh, Immersion. Yeah, and I mean, like I said, I think this is the sort of 
contextual element that Warhammer has built its entire world upon. We like, play, we play this game for the models. It's they're so good. And the story, the image, the painting, the bringing this to life, having your army, the story of your army, arguing about the greater world. Join any Facebook group about 40K or AOS, and it's hugely discussion of the story in the world. I can't wait until we talk about our scores. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, 40K, you mentioned earlier, like, 40K is so insane with the immersion. Like, we think of it as a, a, mm -hmm. it all gets talked about in these whack terms. But yeah, every other post in 40K Facebook groups is something about an element of the story yeah. in the world that people are immersed in and arguing about, right? That's oh, that's what takes up people's interest. On a, out, outside of the lore, on a game-by-game -game basis, every game tells a story. Yeah. Yep. Every, every character, every unit can perform great feats. And you remember those great feats. You remember the time that... Uh, you remember how a, a single Ard boy survived a stone horn. <laughs> you remember how Archaon died to deadly terrain when you were on table 10. Hey, you know, oh, the answer is there is great you roll better clearly, but sure. Absolutely. You were, hey, you were I usually that. roll pretty well on deadly terrain. <laughs> I remember <laughs> when my the mall crush it. I remember when my KO were mowed down around a, uh, an idle rock. <laughs> Yeah, 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 indeed. That's the good stuff, and that and that all happens because because of those dice, because of those uh, little moments where the rolls go your way when they shouldn't, or go against you when they shouldn't. Uh, right. And then creativity. I don't think we need to even cover this, man, because this is it's such an obvious, intensive, yeah. in, like it's, it's uh, immutable, game. unseparable part of this hobby. And I, I really, how they've been encouraging with the Twitch stream and with Duncan videos, the creative aspect of the hobby. You know, right. people say, oh, match play, match play. They just push match play. Man, they are all about the hobby. They are all about the narrative. They are all about creating your own. Do you see that uh, Duncan made that war band? Um, yeah. Included, really yeah. beautiful. Uh, they, want, they want you to come up with a history for your guys. And I mean, we spend a, a lot more time thinking about this game than we do playing it. You know, you're, Absolutely. Thinking, you're thinking about your backstory of your armies, you're exploring, you're discovering, uh, coming up with new ideas. And then of course, list building um, is creativity. Yeah, and that's just it, it all falls under this. Yep. Almost every army purchase is because of some element of creativity. It's either you thought of a cool theme story conversion for it, or if you're the other side of the sort of, you know, psychographic motivation of gathering utility, you We're thought of an you, awesome Ryan. list, right? You <laughs> thought of an awesome list or, or combination or synergy, right? Or, or you that's all creativity. Awesome job. Yeah. 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 But both sides of that, right. Mm -hmm. Be it the hobby, like, it's all that creativity. It's just people expressing their creativity through different aspects and the game channels all of that. Right. Yeah. It's banging on all cylinders. So, so do we want to talk about our own sort of, uh, our own sort of elements to yeah. this and how we apply? Yeah. Let's do that next. Okay. So, uh, so Tom, just looking at this before I switch over to any scores, I don't know if you have yours ready. I have yeah. mine teed up. Where did you think looking at these that you, you would rank? Um, so it's funny because like I didn't, I was thinking about it in the four tier, not the six tier model necessarily. Sure. But if I were to look at this, I would think that I would score very high in for like what I enjoy of like mastery, uh, maybe achievement and creativity. Maybe a little bit of action mixed in there. Okay. Uh, hold on. No, mm, probably more social than action, just from the competition standpoint, like as a secondary. Mm. Yeah, something like that. Sure. I mean, for me, it's, it's, I would have, you know, like where I, I think what I predicted is more you or less. Would be action. I yeah, I think with one exception, like I would think I, like I do love action in a game a lot more than, than uh, anything else, but, or a lot more than many other things, but like, the social aspect of getting together people, obviously the creativity. So here was my actual score. Yeah, I want right to see here. yours. Okay. And it maps almost exactly to social and creativity. Oh, and man. like my action mastery achievement, and then like immersion's the lowest, which doesn't surprise me at all. 
Yeah. Because I classically don't care about the story except at a, like a, a high level. You yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. the details of the minutia is so, is so not real to me. Right. Like this isn't a real, yeah. Like I like the broad strokes of the world. Does that yeah. make sense? Yep. Not the nitty gritty. And so I think that contributes, whereas all three of these are almost equal poles. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the social and the creativity aspect is not, surprising to me at all like yep that's why i'm here i get together every saturday to play so i can hang out with my friends and i and i hobby all the time and paint all the time yep those are my things right and all the rest of these are are equal to some degree right like they pull at me equally yeah. like i want to be good at playing i want to achieve various things and i want to have yeah and what makes what's interesting to me is having an action-filled game yep. so when i did my profile by the way let me just say um, I didn't like I, when I did my export, I exported my secondaries, I think accidentally rather than my primary, ah. which it doesn't matter. Like it's, it, it's all going to show my skew. Sure. Does that make sense? Because yep. it basically breaks it down to my subcategories. Yep. Are you guys ready for this? Sure. Do you want to share your screen? Uh, yeah, I'm going to do that real quick. Yeah. Uh, I just need to pull it out. Uh, so what do you guys think my four are or my, my primaries are? Like, where do you think I skew towards? Certainly toward the mastery one and the achievement one would be my guess. And social and action. Where did he go? You see there me? Is. Oh, there yeah. it is. Yep. <laughs> I love <laughs> Wow. Discovery six <laughs> percent. Yeah, so that's what's what was so fascinating to me. Now, to talk about this though, I was in the mindset of thinking about MMOs with this because that's the framework that they ask in the quiz is for like video games. Yeah. Sure. Um. So that discovery aspect is like world exploration, and that's how they're framing those questions. I suspect that this would skew a little bit differently if I was thinking about it with regard to because. Yeah. So when I took the this. And I did it using, um, I did it using the other chart, like the uh, mm -hmm. like using the board game one. It skewed a little bit differently, um, obviously. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, you can see obviously some of my skews here. Uh, the one that was really surprising to me is this competition community one. Um, how hard that skewed? Um, that surprised me a little bit. Um, but you'll notice that like the whole power. Um, aspect the action aspect is not real not as strong as a lot of this other stuff uh, but as you can tell vince uh that whole story thing mm. yeah exactly you're flat here <laughs> hold on real quick i'll go back and i'll share again you can leave yours up like don't stop yeah. sharing um but here's my secondaries okay yep so mine skews way over here toward the discovery and design thing right yep. and like the community aspect of this side is pulled out, but the competition is like way down. Whereas yours was, was not that way. My challenge strategy, completion power, like, blip, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so there you go. Fantastic. Um, so Andrew, what about yourself, man? Where do you fall in all this? Uh, mastery and social competition. Yeah. And then creativity. The thing is, uh, I put, I call myself a pretty fickle person. Mm. Uh, the Montessori educators like to sell themselves on this. Like you love everything. So you teach everything, right? Uh, that that's kind of true. Um, I change based, based on mood and that's why this hobby works so well. Uh, if I want to build a hard as nails list, I can sit, build a hard as nails list. If I want to work with my hands and do something creative, um, and I get that kind of reward, the reward juice is flowing. I can do that. But, you know, sometimes I want to sit at the bar and play cards mm -hmm. and not have to think too much about them. So just like you can be in mood, different mood for different kind of music. You can be in different kind of mood for different kind of games. And my I do change quite often, but I always come back to chess. Um, and, you know, if I want action, I'll just play faster chess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> always there for me. Um, yeah. But as, yeah. as far as my motivations for Warhammer go, uh, Mastery, competition, and creativity, both um, 
yeah, design, mostly design creativity. Yeah, I mean, it's funny you mentioned the different things, and Tom mentioned sort of the anchoring at the beginning. It's a fascinating point because it's true. I think that, like, I definitely have a different set of sort of priorities if I'm playing the game at home yeah. you know, on the weekend yeah. Yeah. versus if I go to an event. A, an event, yeah. And that's a good segue to lead into our next... Or even what type of event it is. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah like going to Holy Wars would be different if you're competing. Right. Right. Um, or if I'm if I'm going to some big crazy multiplayer thing, right? Like when you get involved in like an epic event where you've got like six people aside, two thousand points each, you know, like so it really it shifts your motivations all around because of the framing device that you're experiencing it in, right? You you gotta you gotta set yourself up with good expectations, and I think that this motivational model is a good tool to assist with that. I mean, um, communicate with the other players. Find players who meet your motivations. And if your motivations have shifted, you can tell them, hey, I'm not, I'm not in it for a hard game right now. Uh, let's, can we roll some dice? Can we do something else? Can we play Shadespire really quick? Whatever it is you want to do. Um, also, if you're meeting a new person, you should be able to communicate with them. Because if yeah. you don't, if you go through your life, just life in general, gaming too. If you go through your life assuming that everybody you meet has the same motivations that you do, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. Right. And all it takes is a little 30 second conversation and some of the language to talk about it if you're talking about gamer motivational models. Um, if we know what motivates us, then we can seek out experiences that will make us happy, i.e., in our scenario, choose the right game to play with the right people to play. And some people don't have your same motivations and never will. Don't play with them. If yeah. they can't give you a good game, you know, time, time is your resource. Don't waste your own time. Don't put yourself in a situation that makes you unhappy. Don't, don't play a game that you find boring or don't play a game that you find too challenging if you're not in a mood to be challenged. Um, and I think... The final thing I have here on our notes is we need, we should apply this to soft scores. Mm. I mean this, what I mean by this is understanding your opponent's motivations is an, is a necessary step. It, 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 we're really judging people, right? When we make sportsmanship awards um, or decisions on the, on those score sheets. Right. And if we're judging their sporting character, you got to know their motivations. You got to know what they consider to be good sporting behavior uh, because it might be something different. Um, like Joe, who I play a lot with, he's quiet. He's focused when he plays the game. He doesn't chat much. Maybe somebody interpret this as like uh, bad sportsmanship, but it's not. Yeah. It's, just it's way, not way, yeah. his idea. His idea of, um, of respecting you is giving you the best game you can. Um, and it, knowing the other person's motivations, I think can really help out in that regard and really get you to know the person a little better as a, as opposed to making judgments. Right. Well, it's also interesting because it can help you. I think if you understand yourself and your own motivations, right? Like we just kind of went through and did our little score and thought about, and it's not like as though the score should be the end of your conversation. It's something to get you thinking about what you value in the game, mm -hmm. right? Like that's how it should be used. It's the starting point of your introspection, not the, not the end of the discussion. Right. Um, but like in thinking about what makes me motivated in the game, what makes me interested in the game, it's interesting because it can also help you compromise and find the middle ground with players who have other motivations. Right. Right. Like Tom and I generally have a good game, even though we have extremely different uh, sort of motivations. Because Vince knows what I want. <laughs> yeah. Right. And also like, I'll Just say at the beginning, the hey, can you... yeah. yeah, if it's a friendly game, I'll say, hey, can you not play this army that mm -hmm. I know, like this particular one force that I, you know, because I know you have choices. I hate playing that force because of the nature of the game that it comes out of it, right? So Tom might have another army he can play that will still give him you know, a, a reward, but then I'll also find engaging and that will let hit me meet him halfway and give him an engaging game. That's then, not against something that I'm going to have yeah. a bad time. With. And that, that, but, that comes down to that, um, to, to the basic structure of Warhammer is it's up to the players to get the good game. Right. It's a, if you're playing chess, it's mostly balanced, black pieces, white pieces, 
you sit down, you play, you can get a good game if you're good. With Warhammer, if you're picking, you're picking those armies, man. Um, if you're playing a friendly game, you can choose to give your opponent a real shit game if you pick a, a bad matchup for them. So that's uh, that's up to you. And what does that feed into? The social. Right. Right. Absolutely. Now, obviously, at a tournament, you don't have that luxury, right, to be able to yeah. say, oh, let me take a different army or whatever. But nonetheless, at a tournament, well, I think it's... it's you do. No, 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 stop. You do. And what I mean by that is this. I did. Yeah. Like, I this time around at Akon, I had the option of taking a very competitive KO list. You know, like, I had everything painted for a clown car. I could have rolled out with that, but I knew the kind of game it generated, and I just made a conscious decision at the beginning that I wasn't going to give people that game. Sure. No, I understand that. I just mean like you don't like if your list does what it does and you accidentally end up in a situation where you're almost at like a uh, where you it's where the list is skewed very much in your favor. Yeah. Right. Figure out what that like having a conversation with the other person about sort of the way they play. Even you can do this even over the course of the game. Like, hey, how are you going to play? What are you doing? Why do you play? Why would you build this army? Whatever. Just normal conversational stuff. Um can then also help you steer into a better game for them, right? Because even if you kick their teeth in, you can still, if that's not what they were really there for, if they brought like a fluff bunny army or, you know, a particular weird force, like they have their all Eshin force, right? There could be very something very different that they're there for. Right. Right. And it can help you. I discovered that when I played Kenny in round three. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying Kenny isn't there to win at all costs? No, no, he wasn't. And no. so I tried to adjust my play style and kind of lighten up a little bit because I knew that like my very hard edge, you know, like in like in the intensity often that I take my bring to my game. Like well, I yeah, knew you was are not going to do anything for a friendship. You what? You are a very quiet player when you play normally. Oh, I am. I am. Yeah. Because you're very focused on like measurement. You're thinking about units. You're thinking about movement. You're thinking about this stuff. And like the problem is if, if somebody else showed up and just wanted to like hang out and roll some dice, well, you know, the reality is if you brought like a pretty good list and they brought a sort of mediocre list and they're not that interested in giving like the hardest edge game anyways, well, you were probably already going to win at that point. Right. right. So right. like you can wheel it back. Right. <laughs> you can still, you can still achieve your end of a victory while still wheeling it back and playing yep. a little, you know, like a little more like conversational type of tone game. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I've had to learn how to do that. Like that's a skill that I did not inherit, like in like inherently have coming into Warhammer. And I mean, it, like for me, it began to show. Like I took third in sports on Vanguard, you know, because I tried to be real intentional about engaging and and not you know not going as hard edge as I have traditionally done. Yeah, and I think that it's also like you know we keep talking about it in terms of like whack versus fluff or something, but that's really not all this comes down to. Right. Right. It also comes down to all the rest of those different elements. We talked about why these people are, are in it and playing it. If they're there for the hobby, having a discussion about your stuff, you enjoy hobbying and what, why they painted their army, how they did or whatever, like being able to, to converse with somebody about the thing they're passionate about. Yeah. yeah. That's that. That's that empathy. Yeah. And to me, that's where it translates into sports. Right. Like into that thing. And, and the reason why this game does stand apart, because to me, the worst game is the worst game is generally the game where I'm sitting there for two and a half hours silent with somebody else who's silent. And we're both just like, move here. Uh, I've got 17 in, in uh, range here. Uh, well, you got two attacks. Away from the table and 34 attacks. I, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I did. I was just like, dude, just f finish your turn. I'll be back in a minute. You know what I mean? Like, you don't need me for this, clearly. Like, I'm not an active participant in this, so why don't you just do whatever you're doing and I'll be back. when I was playing that Nurgle army for those that don't... Uh... Correct. Mm. Yeah. Um, that was my solution. Leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I think an, an important thing to uh, leave us with is just to say none of these motivations are better than any other. Just like no person is better than any other. And we all have multiple motivations and everybody's free to have their motivations they want. If you don't get along with somebody's motivations, you don't have to play them. And if it's a tournament, well, you'll be done with them in two hours. No worries. Yep. That's a great piece of advice. Absolutely. And, and I, I think with any player, you're going to be able to find common ground, especially in Warhammer, man. If they painted their army, you got common ground. Right.
if they've yeah. read a, a, a battle tome, you've got common ground. Yep, exactly. There's so much, and that's just it, because, like, and I think one of the reasons I like this test is because it does show that everybody generally, except for Tom with his wacky, like, almost <laughs> 0% in that one category. Um, but most people have extensions out of some degree or another hey, in the categories. Whatever, whatever stories GW makes up to make them sleep at night, that's fine. <laughs> um, but I'm going to roll some dice and I'm going to smash some face. Sure. Well, also okay, okay. part of that is because I know you just like you, the story is what you make it. You're a very personal yeah. story for your own self. You have stories behind your forces, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's yeah. But you own that. Yeah. You don't give GW license to your story. Right. 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 Yep. 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 Which, is, which is part of what makes us love the game so much. Right. Yeah. Because we do have the freedom to do that. So, yep. and then, you know, it may be somebody is motivated by story um but i, I don't want to get my story game from warhammer i'll go play torchbearer for that i'll go sure play. absolutely yeah there are but yeah. i just i just prefer prefer to get it from a different way or or i'll just read um 100 percent. yes or maybe yes. Uh, there maybe can be different just like you mentioned there are different motivations you have when you're doing when you're pursuing different games right you enjoy them with, with because of the sort of weird alchemy alchemical mix of what that game offers it yep. trips off certain things more, right right and you can say especially like if a, if it's game night board game night you bring everybody over hey what kind of mood are you guys in i'm feeling mastery mood you feeling mastery mood all right let's get out the 18xx games let's do it you know as an aside um i just want to mention this we had talked about uh like moods and how those f affect our gameplay kind of and, and what i would also say is expectations with that yep Mm -hmm. um because i just want to show a brief so i retook these quizzes a couple times and i took it with different mindsets and what i mean by that is this um the first time i took the board game one i took it with the mindset of what it looks like when my wife and i and our friends get together and play a board game mm -hmm. or like when i sit down with my kids okay and this is the profile that it spit out for me okay for like this is my profile when i'm sitting down to like play some even some like warhammer quests some of the, my cooperative games or stuff like that like i like the conflict and strategy but most of the time like i don't like the social manipulations i don't like messing with other players i'm aiming like for cooperation fun kind of immersion aesthetics like those are the things that i'm into when i'm doing that but then so here's when i switched like so that's what i had and then i went okay well what is this and i realized they had in the board game category they like classified warhammer as that and i'm like oh I'm supposed to be thinking about this with regard to Warhammer and what this looks like when I play Warhammer. Um, and this is what happened to my chart. I can't wait to see the opposite chart. <laughs> Bam. Yep. There it is. Ah! So like when I roll up to the Warhammer table, like this is, this is the mindset that I have coming into the game, which is like suddenly like conflict shoots up, like smashing people off the table strategy like in aesthetics immersion, which was interesting to me, but it's not surprising because of like the armies that I built. Sure. Does that make sense? Like that's yep. where that kind of, you know, re pops up and fits in. Yep. Um, so anyways, and then obviously discovery shoots up as the list building and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting to me that literally from a, like which games I'm, am I playing and what is the creative like purpose of sitting down? My motivations just change. So very cool. And, That's it's a great, great example. I mean, and in knowing that can be the difference between a good night or a bad night for you and your group of friends. Yeah. Yeah. I learned that I can't take my, my Warhammer mentality into silver tower. Yeah. You can't be like, sorry, sorry, twins. You're out of here. Get this weak sauce off of my table. <laughs> you know, like when I, when I roll up with, uh, you know, against my seven year old son playing battle masters, so the funny thing here is like Battle Masters is a very similar game to Warhammer for any of you guys to know. Like it's like it's a, a a big three by three foot board grid game units like the whole deal. Um, but I skew towards like the fun social. Like I'm not trying to smash my son off the table. I mean, even though I am, I want to give him a good game. Like it's it's just a different mentality than what's happening when I'm sitting down for Warhammer. Sure. So it's it's a fun it's a fun kind of hilarious, um, you know. Well, there you go. So I, I think we've, we've got to the end uh, of this, but this has been awesome. Here's what I would say. 
I think it'd be cool if uh, some people go take the little quiz. You don't have to give them any information to actually take it. You can just go through as a guest and do it also. Don't worry about this that. It's not like a Facebook app where like it's going to no, be. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Go to the website and then you can put in what information you want. You can do it completely anonymously. So whatever. Um, and uh, it'd be fun for people to share their scores down below to see how how uh, how people match up. How do and, you skew? And, yeah, exactly. How do you skew? But uh, Andrew, man, this has been totally awesome. I loved having this on. I'm glad we finally got to do this and talk about yeah. this. It's just super fun. So appreciate you coming on, brother. Yeah, it was a pleasure to be here, guys. Absolutely. We'll uh, we'll have to have you back and see what else we can expand on and talk about in the future because uh, this Absolutely. is something that's near and dear to my heart. This kind of like uh, the reason why we do things and the utility we get out of them. I think helping identify your passions is really important and sort of understanding yourself, right? Uh, the un... What is it? The unexamined life is not worth living. There you go. So, yeah, all it's right. Great. It's great for game designers, too. If you ever think about designing yep. a game, don't try and put all six in your game. Try and pick some. Try and know your audience. Yeah, absolutely. Lean in certain directions. Mm -hmm. Yep. Have things you do well, and then sometimes the rest can emerge. Mm -hmm. All right. But for all of you out there, thank you very much. We appreciate you watching, as always. Uh, remember everything we talked about for our picks. Those are all down in the comments. As always, thank you to Andrew. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next Wednesday.